everyone, Kat here. Well, the first DLC for Scarlet and Violet came out today, and I'm going to chat about it from a writer's perspective. I'll be critiquing the story elements of the DLC the same way I would a book, meaning there won't be any major spoilers, but I may reference events in a vague way to make a point. The idea isn't to tell you what happens, it's to tell you if I think you'll get a satisfying read out of it. Since this is functionally a sequel, I will reference events from Scarlet and Violet itself. I started the Teal Mask in a skeptical mood. I really wanted to see Nimona, Arvin, and Penny on this class trip, not the three random students you end up going with. The way the main trio played off each other in Area Zero felt so fun and authentic, and I was sad it got so little time in the game. Of course, the gang has valid reasons not to go on this trip. It's only select students, after all. Nimona is busy with student council stuff, Arvin is desperately trying to graduate on time, and Penny not only hates adventuring, she has a pretty hefty debt to pay back to the Pokemon League. But I felt like they could have easily come up with arbitrary reasons for them to come along too. In other words, the Teal Mask had to sell me on the citizens of Kitakami hard and fast. Did they succeed? I'd say for the most part, yes, with some caveats. Of course, we can't discuss new human characters without also discussing the new legendary Pokemon as well. These guys, Okidogi, Monkey Dory, and Pheasantipity, are known as the Loyal Three, and their background story is heavily inspired by the Japanese myth, Momotaro. If you've watched Jaden Animations getting her virtual parrot to tell a story, that's the story it's telling. Except with a boy named Robin coming from an egg instead of a boy named Taro coming from a peach. Anyway, I'll include a link in the description. Misui Town is effectively the Pokemon equivalent of the village Momotaro saved from an ogre, or rather an ogre pond centuries earlier. So naturally, the people there not only have statues to honor the Loyal Three, they also hold a massive festival each year to celebrate them. And, lucky for our protagonist, Juliana, sorry if you picked Florian, she arrives on the first day of their Festival of Masks, which, yes, includes the ogre-ousting minigame seen in the previews. It was cute? I don't know, maybe Legends Arceus made me wary of mochi in Pokemon games for the foreseeable future. What's interesting about the setup here is that Pokemon is coming from a long line of previous in-game mythos. And one common theme in all that lore is no Pokemon species is inherently evil. Even the Treasures of Ruin, which I was hoping would be the promised tie-in to the Baldean lore, were born from people's negative emotions first. Also, no comment on whether or not they actually do get referenced in the Teal Mask. So even before things get started, there's a strong vibe that the story is more complicated than just good Pokemon fought bad Pokemon a long time ago, the end. Speaking of, can we talk about the origin story of Pulchegeist and how similar it is to the Treasures of Ruin? All the Treasures of Ruin are born from strong negative emotions combined with physical objects. Or maybe the objects were already possessed by dark types who fed on those emotions? That's my favorite fan theory anyway. Pulchegeist is born from the deep regret of a dying tea maker combined with his beloved tea caddy. It's pretty similar to Wochian, which is born from the bitterness of an executed scribe and the tablets he used to write down an evil king's misdeeds. I love how Pokemon has so many of these creepy mini stories in the decks and the lore, but let's get back to the human characters. Miss Briar is the Blueberry Academy teacher who meets Juliana and her travel companions in the Academy entrance hall. She's your chaperone for the trip. Pokemon has never been too subtle in character design, and it's clear from the get-go that Ms. Briar has a keen interest in the pterosaur phenomenon. She's pretty close in personality and fashion sense to Naranja Academy's history teacher, Miss Ryford. There is nothing on the surface that says she's straight-up villainous, but like Arvin's parents and Ryford, she's got an obsessiveness with a single subject that can cloud her judgment if push comes to shove. Briar isn't a huge character in this story, but they do a nice job of setting her up for a bigger role in the Indigo Disc. The second character you meet is Ms. Briar's student, Carmine, who welcomes you when you arrive to Kitakami and immediately tells you to taste dirt. She's aggressive with Juliana for little reason beyond she's an outsider and therefore untrustworthy. She won't even let her enter Masui Town at first. The only thing that gives Carmine a slight edge on the standard bully trope is her relationship with her little brother Kieran, who she cares about quite a bit. 
This kid immediately reminded me of Alistair from the Galar region, hiding his face and shying away from others. Except unlike Alistair, he has someone who is actively undermining any new relationship he tries to start. Oddly enough, it's not even obvious at first that she does care about him. She speaks pretty roughly to him more than once. But before I bash Carmine too much, I've got to say the story does eventually dive into her character a little deeper. It doesn't justify all her behavior, but it does make her more understandable. Kieran doesn't really have any friends, due in no small part to his overprotective big sister. It's clear from the start that these two siblings are the core of the story. So naturally, I had Juliana go and make a pest of herself with them as soon as the game let me. Which wasn't hard to do. There are multiple quests as in the main games, complete with photo ops and everything, but they don't intersect as much as before, and the title or teal mask plot is front and center. You'd have to go out of your way to avoid it. Blueberry Academy conveniently sends the students on a self-guided tour of Kitakami, not unlike a miniature version of Naranja and Uva Academy's treasure hunts. Bye kids, go discover something, let us know how it turns out! Perrin's quest isn't even available at first, she just greets you and that's about it. Perrin is a photographer, and very obviously a descendant of Adamin from Legends Arceus. I enjoyed the continuity nod here, if characters from his Sui can look like near identical versions of modern characters, then the reverse should be true too, right? Perrin introduces herself and asks for Juliana's help using purposely vague language like, the reason I came to Kitakami was actually to find a certain Pokemon and photograph it. But this is only after you complete the Kitakami decks. She's basically a post-game quest, which I much preferred to the alternative of shoehorning her in just so the TL Mask could keep that open world vibe from the main games. Regardless though, I was more interested in traveling with Kieran to the various historical sites on our treasure hunt, uh, the self-guided tour. At each stop along the tour, Juliana learns both more about Kieran and the legend of the Loyal Three. This is where the story really got going, and it's the part of the DLC I enjoyed the most. I'm going to be pretty vague with the details here, but let's just say... If you thought Starfall Street was the last time you'd feel guilty about winning a battle, you'd be wrong. How does the plot of the Teal Mask hold up against the main game's epic tale of time travel, ecological threat, and secret AI robots? Surprisingly well. Especially when you consider how much less time they had to tell this story. If I had to give this story a rating, I'd say it's a solid 4 out of 5. The characters really made me feel for them beyond what I expected. And because this was a shorter tale, not trying to deal with any grand scale problems, it made the ending feel more tight and satisfying. The only thing holding this back from a perfect score would be some of the motivations. Certain characters suffer from communication failures that are highly plot convenient. They could have worked, but I needed more convincing that the actions the characters took really were the best options they had. Not unlike Penny and Arvin in the main games, being secretive with Juliana at first largely in the name of false suspense. Though about those caveats I mentioned, there is one aspect of the plot that's clearly a setup for the Indigo Disc. But that's forgivable seeing as how we were told this is a two-parter from the start. I still like the characters from the main game better, but I certainly developed a soft spot for Kieran maybe even Carmine to some extent. I'm looking forward to seeing them return in the Indigo Disc. I mean, hey, at least we have some recurring characters here, despite their obvious flaws of not being Nimona, Penny, or Arvin. Oh, and if anyone is wondering, yes, there are glitches in the Teal Mask too. That is one part of Scarlet and Violet we can always depend on. That'll wrap up this review. If you guys want to watch another review, or if you're intrigued by fan fiction about Scarlet and Violet's glitches becoming canon, you can check out my channel for more videos. Until next time, happy reading and happy training!